John Edward Broadbent was born in the automaking town of Oshawa, Ontario in 1936. He worked as an academic before starting his political career with the New Democratic Party. In 1968, Ed Broadbent was elected Member of Parliament for Whitby, Oshawa. By 1975, he was leader of the NDP. As head of the party, Broadbent staked out a populist position on economic issues. The banking system in Canada, unlike the banking system in the United States, unlike the banking system in almost any other country, is ridden with loopholes that enables the banks, unlike the other parts of the, the business sector, to earn virtually rip-off profits. Now, why don't Mr. Clark and Mr. Trudeau say the bank should bite the bullet, as well as the ordinary Canadian? Broadbent also took strong positions on issues often defined as progressive, like child poverty, Aboriginal rights, and women's rights. When we spoke, I asked Broadbent to define progressive in a contemporary context. Progressive means uh, being concerned about the degree of inequality that exists in Canada and coming up with some answers, hopefully, to deal with it. It means being concerned with the prospect of the average man or woman in, in terms of getting a job, and not just a job, but a full-time job, hopefully. Uh, it means uh, being concerned about a green economy and not just any job, but looking towards the future. So those kinds of concerns, uh, working, um, inequality, uh, the environment, combined in a package would, for me, sort of constitute uh, what modern social democracy ought to be concerned about. And you've been talking and working on this concept of social democracy decades and decades. Yes. How are we doing? Where is Canada on kind of the scale of how we could be doing? Well, how on a scale of how we could be doing, not, not well. I mean, if you look at the OECD countries, on, on the first item I mentioned on inequality, in the last 15 years roughly, uh, Canada became more unequal more quickly than most of the OECD countries. Uh, we're still in about the middle range of, in terms of inequality, but we have been going over that broad period anyway in the wrong direction. The last couple of years we picked up a bit, but broadly speaking, become, we have become a more unequal society. And that, that should concern us because it, 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 at the same time, within the OECD, about 14 countries have become less uh, unequal. So it's not a matter of us being all part of a global trend that everyone's more unequal, some countries are less unequal. We have uh, institutions, structures in place that would promote social democracy. So our universal health care, universality or portability of education, uh, the funding of those things. Are we mismanaging them? Are they not doing what they, uh, they once did to promote kind of e equality? No, I think that those, uh, you know, take our health care. It's by no means perfect, as any Canadian would say. Uh, there are some problems. But again, I would think, and I know a survey data on this, that a large majority of Canadians are, are broadly speaking, ha happy with their public health care system. So it's, it's not a, so much a matter of existing illustrations, if we can put it that way, of social democracy like uh, Medicare is a good example of where something's been taken out of the market and made a right for citizens. It's, it's been inattention to the economy on the one hand, uh, uh, total hands off uh, when it comes to the economy except for the petroleum sector which the present government favored through tax incentives and a lot of other things. It's, it's been a matter of not introducing certain things that ought to have been introduced uh, like universal child care. Universal child care, when it was brought into Quebec, not only had the effect of reducing costs so very significantly for ordinary families to, to pay for child care, but it brought many more women into the labor market who contributed taxes once they were working and actually, as a study showed, made a net contribution to the Quebec economy. So it's been a failure to adapt, uh, bring it to Canada certain new aspects of social democracy, if you like, like they take for, for granted uh, child care in virtually all Western European countries. So, you need, but you need, that's the absence of uh, a government that wants to move in that direction. Mr. Harper clearly has a different kind of 
um, ideology at work. And so over the period he's been there, there hasn't been a move, uh, surprise, surprise, towards more, more progressive government, if you like. You were part of an era in government when uh, government wasn't quite the dirty word it is today. Uh, when politicians weren't seen as necessarily liars and uh, and people who just wanted to spread money around to their friends. That is a view that is widely held now. The bigger the government, the lazier it is, the less effective it is, is a view. And yet, as you say, you your institute has produced research that show that government actually can be a great facilitator of important things, good investments, long-term thinking. Right. How do we get back there? Uh, almost on a, on a public relations point of view, how do we get citizens thinking more warmly about what government can do for them? Would you like to ask an easier question? <laughs> no, I, I mean, it, it, it is, uh, it, uh, to say the least, a complicated thing to turn around uh, directions, precisely because government, even if it's an inactive one in the private sector the way uh, Mr. Harper's government is, to turn it around it, it takes energy and, and, and ideas. Uh, but uh, part of it is the ideological point. I think part of it is to openly address this issue that government by definition is bad. I mean, part, part of the legacy that came, uh, started back in the 1980s with Mr. Reagan in the U.S. and Margaret Thatcher in, in the U.K. It spread here in the 80s and 90s, the, the view that uh, instead of talking about citizens, we talked about taxpayers. The implication being that somehow your freedom is reduced, by the way, they would say, if you pay more taxes rather than good investment leading to more freedom. So there was an ideological accompaniment to this drift away from government involvement that den actually denigrated government. So we, we have to counter that by showing examples that work. Uh, making it clear that you're not interested in government for its own sake, but because it can do something. I often say, for example, that Tommy Douglas, it should be remembered, and when he advocated universal health care back in Saskatchewan, it was a, as a practical solution to a real problem. It wasn't that he sat down and said, oh, well, let's have a, a big new government enterprise. The, there was a real problem with health care and health care financing, and the solution was, in his government's view, this something we now call Medicare. And so we need that approach. You get away from the idea that you want government for its own sake, but for real problems. So that those of us, so I grew up in an automotive town. Uh, I would not, the last thing I would ever want would be the public ownership of the automotive industry. That's an industry you want, competition, innovation. Um, but I also grew up in an era that believe the governments can and should do something. So we have to ideologically, if you like, talk about that openly and frankly, and when we want um, the government action to make sure that it's, it's out there, like childcare to deal with a real problem and not just for its own sake. Coming up, Ed Broadbent reflects on a time when social democratic ideals were shared by politicians across the ideological spectrum plus the important work he says Canadian leaders have left unfinished. More of Amanda Lang's Access interview with Broadbent is just ahead. Ed Broadbent resigned as NDP leader in 1989, later becoming president of the International Centre for Human Rights and Democratic Development. He returned briefly to politics in 2004, winning a seat in Ottawa Centre. Broadbent kicked off his last federal campaign with tongue firmly in cheek. Who's back? Ed is back. Say what? I'm the one you all should know. Once more popular than Trudeau. Today, Broadbent is chair of the Broadbent Institute, a think tank dedicated to promoting progressive government policies, particularly economic ones. For Broadbent, economic reform has been a long-standing goal. It's time that we took those resources of ours, instead of exporting them all over the world, we started concentrating and, and, and making the furniture here instead of the selling the wood, sell the furniture. Make the petrochemical products here instead of selling off the natural gas that we can do in short what other industrial countries have done, get control of our own future. 
When we spoke, I asked Broadbent if he was optimistic about government action to diversify the Canadian economy. In the short run, not too optimistic, because the government, if, we, if you look at the policies that we've had, we have now amongst the lowest corporate tax rates in the world. But the Canadian private sector, uh, on its own anyway, haven't been using these tax benefits for more R&D. We have a, a very bad uh, record compared to not only the U.S., but to Germany, to Denmark, to almost, almost any other developed country. So uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the role of, of, of government as a facilitator uh, takes some time, but even by uh, moving now, which we should, say in the, in the energy sector, if we had a real commitment to green energy instead of, as this government had put all its resources in the last few years and wanted to make us a big energy, but petroleum specifically, not hydro, say, where we have a surplus and it could be exporting more, but they put it all in the petroleum ba basket. Well, we should have a more diverse approach and not just rely on a tax uh, cut to the corporations, but to relate the tax cut to R&D spending, for example, and for the government itself, through discussions with the private sector, uh, to talk about uh, green energy projects like other countries are. And that's because it's a cliche, but it's true. That's where future growth is going to come, and we just aren't investing the way we should. And I think through more an initiative, at least, coming from the government and talking with the private sector, we might get the kind of investment in that in that sector that we need. I think it's safe to call you deeply partisan. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, well, I, I'll turn it around. Depends what you mean uh, by that. I'm deeply committed to social democracy, and of course, as a, in in the Canadian context, that means I'm a New Democrat. Uh, but I've recognized, for example, what I'm saying now, that uh, social democrats have existed at different times in all our parties. At one time, I, I'll be candid in this, at one time I would have thought in a liberal cabinet, not today, but at one time when I was there, there were a lot of social democrats that I could mention by name, Monique Bejan, Romeo LeBlanc, Gerard Peltier. There were a lot of people who think uh, in, in philosophical terms the way I do, but I don't think that is the case now. So as a social democrat, I'm more comfortable than ever, if you like, with the New Democratic Party of uh, Canada as it's led by Tom Mulcair. And for that reason, you think he would make the best leader. You d you're not in the scene in the camp that thinks uh, uh, coming together on the center left of the spectrum is a good idea politically. No, I think that uh, the New Democratic Party should promote some of the ideas I've just talked about and the party ha clearly has its own agenda um, and well they've come out for a minimum way increasing the minimum wage universal child care they have the, uh, a political agenda that I think is progressive and desirable and then after an election it's not my job now to speak for the party it isn't my job but uh, as a new democrat I would see after an election if no party as a majority, uh, then uh, Mr. Mulcair would have to sit down with the other leaders and talk about what kind of government should be, could be put together that would reflect the voting intentions of Canadians and should not be dogmatic about that, uh, what that should be. That's one of the things that I admired very much about Jack Layton. When Jack was leader, he really wanted to get things done. And uh, if that meant cooperating with other parties, he did that. And uh, Tom Mulcair has indicated publicly recently that he would be prepared to do that too. So I think it's good. And can we have social democracy, uh, progressive values, and be pro-business, be pro-economic growth and private sector and all of the things that people Abs think absolutely. will fuel the economy? I, 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 there's just no question about that. If you, uh, if you believe in the private sector, and it's not just a slogan for you to get elected, then you ought to have policies that are favorable to that private sector too, in the way that I've talked about. Uh, and there's no contradiction between that and wanting great social public policies like universal child care. Uh, no contradiction. In fact, the most successful social democratic countries in the world, in my view, are the Scandinavians. And the Scandinavians have promoted 
uh, creative, innovative, both in the environmental sense and other respects, private sector as well as having great uh, public sectors. You mentioned some of the research that comes out of the Broadband Institute. Uh, what, what do you hope that that institute achieves? What do you want it to be and do? Well, I li I'd like it to be, in one sense, ahead of the party, if you like. I mean, one of the reasons for it to exist is to be able not to be concerned about short-run political uh, problems. Uh, we should be looking ahead. We should be looking, as I've said, coming up with ideas on how to reduce inequality rather than exacerbate it. Uh, looking again at ways to get more women in the labor market uh, that want to be there. Uh, so we should always be prepared to think outside the box, to think ahead of, um, in one sense, ahead of the, where any political party could be. That's, that's why you need an institute that's at arm's length from the party. Uh, but consi consistent with our political philosophy, if you like, but, um, but realistic and, and looking ahead in terms of what that policy should be. You've spent a lifetime in public service. I, over the course of all of those years, is there an issue or an issue or two that is, is undone for you? Oh, well, un unquestionably, the, the undone one would be child poverty um, because uh, it was my last speech as leader of the NDP back in 1989, just before I stepped down. And, and uh, all three parties at that time agreed that uh, over the next 11 years, by the end of uh, the, the 20th century, there ought to have been a virtual elimination of, of uh, child poverty. Well, in fact, in a majority of those years, uh, the intervening 11 years, child poverty went up. And we're still, we, depending on the criteria, marginally better than where we were in 1989 at over 8% uh, child poverty or according to a different kind of criteria, over 11%. So we have a lot of ground. And they, they have, I mean, politicians ought to be concerned, cliche again, the future belongs to our children and the best way to a healthy future is to have healthy children, which means good housing, good schools, solid environment, uh, dealing with child poverty. So that would be one uh, item that I, I would really, I would like to see governments come to grips with. All right, we'll leave it there. We appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure.